you are able. This day we pray so that God's will, not ours, be done. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for the family of Mount Zion. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless and apathetic, restore those who are penitent, encourage our compassion for one another, so that your will, not ours, be done in these troubled days. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Together we sing our gathering hymn number 561 in your green hymnal.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Let us pray. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 15 responsibly. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. 
They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their help and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading is from James chapter 1. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at the, themselves in a mirror. For they look in this, at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So ends the lessons. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. You, now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around at Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, Envy, slander, pride, folly, all 
these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is the gospel of our Lord. The congregation may be seated. I invite the children forward. Good morning. So from our New Testament reading, what we sometimes call the second lesson that Miss Sandy just read for us, it's from the book of James, and it's just a very small book in our Bible. Do you know who James is thought to be? He could be called an apostle eventually, yes, so that's true. He also is something else, we think, to the best of our knowledge. He is thought to be the brother of Jesus, absolutely, one of them. Because, right, the Bible tells us he had four brothers and more sisters than we know, some sisters. Very good. So James and Jesus would have grown up together. But from our Bible stories, it seems that James did not believe in Jesus while Jesus was um, active in his ministry, teaching the people and the disciples. Or if he did know who Jesus was, it seems that he still wanted Jesus to stop doing what he was doing. It was either making him nervous or he was worried about what was going to happen to Jesus or worried what was going to happen to their family because of what Jesus was preaching. There, there was definitely some trouble there. But after Jesus' resurrection, and do we know what resurrection means? Coming back from the dead. And with Jesus specifically, we believe that after three days, God raised him from the tomb, right? That's what we call resurrection here in church. It seems after that, after that huge event, something changed for James. And James and all of his brothers went on to believe Jesus and become apostles and followers of him. And James went on to become a very important leader in the church. He led the Jerusalem church. So, in our lesson today, James, this great leader and teacher, tells us, be doers of the word and not merely hearers. What the heck does that mean? Edward's, Edward's taken a pass on this one. Anybody else? It's a little tricky. Oh, when he says you do, you don't listen. Well, you listen to me, but instead of just listening to it, you do it. And exactly. The idea of whether we are just hearing it or whether we are actually learning it and doing it. Because even when we learn it, sometimes we don't learn it. So what do you think James means by this? Why would James be trying to teach us this? What, what does he want us to learn? To do what Jesus says, with do being the operative word for James. Don't just tell me that you've heard it and listened to it and that you're all good, but do you do it? So what are some of the things that Jesus taught? What, what are some of the things that Jesus wanted us to do? Treat your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. Jesus said, believe in me. Did Jesus want us to be mean and cranky and terrible to other people? No. 
just the opposite, right? All right, so we're gonna take a little bit of a quiz here. You tell me whether the person I describe is being a doer or just a hearer of the word in these examples. So, and, and these are not all Jesus lessons. I'll, I'll put that around. So your mom or your dad asks you to pick up your room and you say, sure, but then you don't do it. Hearer, okay, yep. One of your friends has a bad day and you go up and sit by them and ask what's wrong. Doer. Doer. You hear some of your friends making fun of another person and you tell them that it's not nice to talk about someone like that. Doer. You run up to your grandma or grandpa and give them a great big hug and tell them you love them. Definitely doer. You see that your mom or dad is feeling tired and you ask them if you can help them or get them anything. Doer. You're playing out at the park or with some friends and you've got your favorite toy and they want to play with it, and you say no. Just the hearer. And if we do say, sure, we, I can do that, what do we flip it to? A doer. Sharing what we have and being kind and helping one, somebody around us have a, a good time. Oh, look at that, in action. So those are some things to be thinking about. When we make decisions about what we do and don't do, we're deciding whether we are being a doer of Jesus' teaching or merely a hearer. And those are things that happen every day throughout all of our lives. And not just kids, but every one of these big kids out in the pews as well. Yes. Uh oh. And so, what do we do when that happens? And maybe when we know that we've made a mistake, we apologize, right? And we try to fix it, and we go back and try again. Because that's what Jesus also teaches, is that there is always a chance to do over and to try and do better. Jesus blesses us with those new chances every day. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Help us to learn how to be doers in the world. Help us to be more like you every day. Teach us how to love with a great big heart. Be kind and merciful to us. Help us to be kind and merciful to others. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may go back to your seats. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Martin Luther once said, quote, But know that to serve God is nothing else than to serve your neighbor and do good to him in love, be it a child, wife, servant, enemy, friend. If you do not find yourself among the needy and the poor, where the gospel shows us Christ, then you may know that your faith is not right, and that you have not yet tasted of Christ's benevolence and work for you. 
Or he also puts it another way. Luther also said, your father in heaven does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. You see, Luther understood well and taught that our faith is lived out in active ways, in service to our neighbor, because Jesus taught us so. As God has so graciously come down to us in Christ, we are to go out to help one another, to serve each other, a cruciform life. Martin Luther understood that our faith is not simply a matter of memorized beliefs, but a Christian life will reflect Jesus's own life when we meet the needs of another, when we ease the suffering of a friend or stranger, when we offer ourselves in any way that might be a help for someone else, reflecting the sacrificial love that Jesus bore onto the cross, offering of himself wholly and completely for the sake of those who were in such desperate need. That's all of us. So it might seem shocking that Luther looked disdainfully upon the book of James. He called it an epistle of straw, biting words from the learned professor and theologian. Somehow Luther could not see his own teachings reflected in James's teaching, and that each aligned faithfully with the teaching and ministry of Jesus himself. Sometimes we, like Luther, can get caught up in our own goals and objectives. We can become so intent on our agenda that we lose sight of the broader perspective. And I think that is what happened to our dear own Martin Luther when he read James. Because you see, as Luther became engulfed in a war against the Catholic Church, his rhetoric had to become sharp and clear, focused and consistent. Luther laid out severe accusations against the Pope and the power brokers at the highest echelons of the church at that time. Luther was forced to articulate clearly and concisely what it was that he disagreed with and why, so that he could argue his position. Luther offered to us his rhetorical gift that we are saved by grace through faith. Grace alone, faith alone, all by God's doing, none of it by ours. Luther taught that it was by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and by the power of God's raising him up on that Easter morning that salvation was given freely to us all by God's gracious provision. We did not earn it. We could not work to achieve it. God destroyed the power of sin and death over God's beloved humanity in an act of boundless generosity, reflecting an everlasting love that has knit together the cosmos from the moment of creation to the time we live in and on into eternity. So when James throws out his cutting yet powerful declaration that faith without works is dead, being a hearer only and not a doer, it seems that Luther just couldn't handle it. Have you ever experienced that, where someone says something so triggering that you don't hear anything else that is said? Perhaps in an argument, when we are not thinking all together clearly, and our passions outrun our patience, and our understanding shuts off, focusing only on that thing we did not want to hear, 
but we did. I think that's what happened to Luther. Because I think if Luther could have calmed his emotions and prevented his gut reaction to James's reference to works from shutting down his capacity to analyze the text, he would find that James is not espousing any kind of salvation theory that would negate Luther's teaching of grace. James is focused on what comes next. Now that we have been saved, how does that impact our lives? How do our lives reflect our blessing of salvation? From James's perspective, certainly there must be some impact that can be seen and understood and felt when one would become a follower of Jesus. The text says we are to be the first fruits of Jesus' love and salvation. We are the harvest which Jesus has planted and tended and cared for, nourished and grown. We who follow Jesus should be recognizable as people who live according to Jesus' teachings, serving, loving, caring, nurturing, feeding. These are actions not merely beliefs. In our Gospels, we learn that Jesus did not come to teach some theology class filled with dry and lengthy doctrine. Jesus did not speak of right belief, but rather showed us right actions. We look at the Good Samaritan, the father who welcomes the prodigal son home, the shepherd out seeking the lost sheep, the healings, the feeding of the multitudes. Jesus is a man of action who is bringing the kingdom among us. We follow him and we seek to live like him. This is what Luther and James both understood. We cannot simply be a people who learn our catechism and Sunday school lessons, affirm that we believe them standing at confirmation, if we do not actually live by them. Those teachings are meant to change us, to reform us, to recreate us as followers of the way of the Lamb who has come to take away the sins of the world. James recognizes that a person who truly follows Jesus is one who will, quote, care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Widows and orphans, you see, were the most vulnerable people in ancient times. It is a phrase that is used throughout our scriptures to reflect that we are to care for the most vulnerable among us, those who are easily oppressed because they lack rights or resources. These are the people the powerful wish to exploit. These are the people who are often ignored and overlooked because they're deemed unimportant. We are to care about the vulnerable and oppressed and victimized and overlooked people in our own time as we become doers of the word. In our time, we look for those who suffer in poverty, those who are experiencing food insecurity, those who experience homelessness or discrimination. We walk alongside those being exploited by working for substandard wages, including undocumented workers. We are to serve them, to ensure that we are not trapped and tempted by the ways of the world in which we become the oppressors and the exploiters, or simply those who ignore the plight of the suffering by complicit silence. In Mark's gospel, as Jesus is debating with the religious leaders, he cautions that things that come from our hearts and direct our actions in sinful ways are what does damage 
to us and to those around us. Jesus raises up the evil behaviors that will hurt us, damaging our souls. Infidelity, greed, meanness, lying, demeaning others and behaving crudely, jealousy, spewing vicious and false words about another, self-promotion, and carelessness. He gives us a long list. But to be sure, this is not intended to be a morality test. We are not meant to examine this list to see how many of these we do or don't do. We are not meant to tally up the foibles of others using this litany to determine their worthiness or ours. Rather, Jesus wants us to understand that when we behave like this, we grow further from the kingdom. In fact, we hinder the coming of the kingdom here on earth, and we grieve God's heart. These things that Jesus lists reflect the world's cruelties and defilement of ourselves that do not reflect the love that Jesus taught, or the Christ-like love we are to show as doers of the word. We are followers of the way of Jesus, and none of those things are part of his righteous way, and it matters to Jesus. Jesus wants us to take these things seriously, knowing that how we live and how we treat others matters. James reminds us that this is what he heard from his brother too, and that he continues his brother's teaching, passing it along to the next generation of believers. The heart of the law, God's law, is love and care for others, justice and mercy for the needy. Jesus says, don't regale me with all your pious worship practices if you walk out these doors and spew vile hatred and careless cruelty and lack compassion. The gospel is good news, but it doesn't mean that it is simple news, nor does it mean that it is not challenging to us. We are called to the ways of Jesus because we are his disciples, students of the kingdom's way. We are saved by a mighty power, bringing life out of death for each one of us. We are renewed in life each day to be doers. That is grace for us. And it is hope that this hurting world needs People of God, hear your baptismal call. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand as you are able. We will sing our hymn of the day.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Calling on the spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of every generation, give the church a sense of purpose and belonging. Sustain and build up leaders and lay people as we accompany one another in our life with Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of creation, you named humans as co-creators with you. Where the earth cries out in pain, bring wholeness. Guide governments and industry that environmental laws and practices seek to heal and not harm. Bring relief and justice to people and places suffering from climate catastrophe. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray for local communities of every kind, rural and urban, established and new. Lead those in authority to seek the good of all through their words and actions and to mentor others in honest and generous ways. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Healing God, you draw near to all who are hurting. Be with all who desire relief from chronic and acute illness, cancer, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Strengthen health care workers, therapists, and caregivers. Tend to those who are close to our hearts, especially Link Mosdy, Linda Eagle, Rhonda Moyer, Josie Clay, Millie Schumberger, Gail, Linda, Sarah, Justin and Lisa, and those we name aloud are in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. On this Labor Day weekend, we remember and give thanks for all who have fought for workers' rights around the world. Continue to improve working conditions and establish fair wages so that all people may thrive. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Comforting God, console us as we mourn our departed. We hold fast to the promise that death has been defeated by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with one another.
I invite the congregation to stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we lift this bread and cup before you, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve as your priestly people. And we ask you, send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, all glory and honor are yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Now, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I invite the congregation to stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God Almighty, God Most Merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. We sing our sending hymn number 406.
people of God, go in peace. Be doers of the word. Follow Jesus. Thanks be to God.